Olá, bom dia. Bem-vindos e bem-vindas. A gente vai começar em alguns minutos, aguardando os demais participantes entrarem. Bom, bom dia a todas e todos, boa tarde, Sophie e quem mais estiver nos assistindo de outras, é, outros locais. Este é o quarto congresso de Direitos Fundamentais e Processo Penal na Era Digital, que é um congresso organizado pelo Internet Lab, com o apoio da Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de São Paulo. Esse congresso é um evento anual que vem nos últimos quatro anos atuando no debate das garantias do devido processo penal e da tutela de direitos fundamentais diante das novas tecnologias. E essas tecnologias, como sabemos, impactam tanto as dinâmicas criminais como a forma como as agências penais operam em resposta. E isso coloca questões sobre a proteção da intimidade do sigilo, novos meios de obtenção de prova e sua admissibilidade, valor para fins de instrução processual e outras questões envolvendo direitos e garantias. Eu sou a Mariana Valente, sou diretora do Internet Lab e gostaria primeiro de dar boas-vindas e agradecer a participação de todos vocês. Algumas instruções muito breves antes de já passar a palavra à nossa painelista Keynote. É, a participação no congresso é restrita aos inscritos, mas as palestras são gravadas e vão ser, ao fim do congresso, disponibilizadas no site e também no canal do YouTube do Internet Lab. Queria contar também que a gente está lançando esse ano o terceiro volume do livro Direitos Fundamentais e Processo Penal na Era Digital, com as contribuições dos painelistas do terceiro congresso do ano passado, que tratou sobre tecnologias de vigilância em massa. A versão digital já está disponível no site do Congresso e em breve vai estar na Amazon também e a gente também lançou a versão digital dos dois 
volumes dos dois congressos anteriores. O congresso emite certificado de participação aos que solicitaram o certificado na inscrição e compareceram a pelo menos 70% do congresso. Bom, essa mesa conta com tradução simultânea em dois canais, do inglês para o português e do português para o inglês. É, vocês podem ver a opção translate na barra do Zoom e ali é possível optar pelo idioma, idioma que você prefere ouvir. Se você optar pela tradução simultânea, você vai ter a opção também de ouvir o áudio original em um volume mais baixo, mas pode também simplesmente mutar o original. A gente vai receber perguntas da plateia, elas devem ser feitas pela janela QIA, Q&A, na barra inferior aqui do Zoom, e a gente recomenda que elas sejam enviadas durante a apresentação, porque nós vamos acompanhar aqui e selecionar algumas delas para respostas ao vivo. Bom, sem mais delongas, eu gostaria de apresentar a nossa segunda keynote speaker do Congresso, é Sophie Clavé. Ela é consultora jurídica sênior na agência AWO, é especialista em proteção de dados e privacidade na área de segurança internacional. Na AWO, a Sophie oferece serviços de consultoria em tópicos como proteção de dados em ações humanitárias, parcerias público-privadas transferência de dados nos setores bancários de, e de aviação civil e uso de tecnologias como biometria. E ela trabalhou anteriormente para diversas organizações internacionais, incluindo foi Data Protection Officer da Unicef em Nova York, Data Protection Advisor na sede do Comitê Internacional da Cruz Vermelha e Office of Legal Affairs da Interpol. Trabalhou também como consultora da Unidade de Integridade do Mercado Financeiro do Banco Mundial e do Escritório da ONU para Assuntos de Desarmamento e como consultora jurídica para crimes financeiros no Ministério da Economia e Finanças da França. Passo então a palavra para a Sophie Clavé, a quem eu já agradeço, é, para sua fala sobre proteção de dados e tecnologias de vigilância, enfrentando as questões de policiamento. Obrigada, Sophie. Bem-vinda. Thank you very much, Mariana, and thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm very glad to participate in this uh, very important and I would say timely event uh, in light of the legislative context uh, in, uh, in Brazil. Um, my presentation will address data protection in the context of the use of surveillance technologies by the police and how it could be possible to bridge gaps, existing gaps. And um, in particular, I will focus on the use of facial recognition in public space for public security purposes and crop control purposes. Um, the presentation is divided into parts. The first one is focused on the identification of key data protection considerations in this specific context. And the second part is dedicated to the development of data protection safeguards in the current context of emergence of ethical artificial intelligence. And as a conclusion, I will also try to present possible avenues of research and considerations for the work of the Special Commission of Jurists, which is entrusted with the, the drafting of the data protection law for the law enforcement sector. But um, before, um, I would like to present two preliminary observations. First, the distinction uh, regarding the distinction of uh, legal regimes, which are applicable to the processing of personal data by police forces and by intelligence services. It is my understanding that the mandate of the Special Commission of Jurists is to draft a law on the processing of personal data for the broad purposes of public and state security, national defense, investigative activities, and prosecution of criminal offenses. However, I would like to strengthen from the outset the importance to distinguish the legal regime, which is applicable to the processing of personal data by police forces on the one hand, and by intelligence services on the other hand. Indeed, uh, it's, it's not new to anyone that their mandate operating procedures, oversight, and accountability mechanisms uh, differ substantially. So 
this distinction is actually made in, in a large number of legislation at national and regional levels. And as is the case uh, with the Data Protection Law Enforcement Directive in the European Union, for instance. So just to let you know that my presentation is, will be therefore focused really on the processing of personal data by police forces. So that was to clarify the, the first point. Um, the second observation I would like to make is about the specificities of the law enforcement sector and the impact on privacy and data protection. So it is a knowledge that given the specific mandate of law enforcement agencies, Specific provisions apply as regard data protection, for instance, uh, regarding transparency and the application of uh, the transparency uh, principle. Limitations to the right to privacy also apply to ensure that the police can effectively fulfill its role and notably in the context of criminal investigations. However, I would also like to uh, underline from the outset that regardless of the type of limitations concerned, the principles of lawfulness and proportionality always apply. In addition, data protection limitation, limitations which are applicable to uh, criminal investigations and related authorized covert surveillance activities, which are uh, usually targeted, are to be distinguished from surveillance operations which are carried out in public space for public security and crowd control. And this is precisely because the purpose in the second case is to ensure public security and crowd control. Therefore, if, for instance, data protection, the data protection principle of transparency can be drastically limited in the context of a criminal investigation, this is not the case for the surveillance of public space for public security and crowd control purposes. Now, turning to the first part of my presentation, I would like to highlight key data protection issues at stake when using facial recognition in public space. Um, the current trend across the world and in Latin American countries is really to provide a so-called tech answer to crime, which includes the use of artificial intelligence by police forces, but also by public authorities in general. Uh, this is how we have seen smart cities, those managed by data-driven technology, grow, and they, uh, they have been growing uh, for a few years now. This trend also concerns Brazil in light of uh, the, 20, the 2018 agreement, which uh, enabled the use of a technology to collect data uh, that is related to the facial expressions of public transport users in the Sao Paulo subway. Um, Nevertheless, this tech answer trend also highlights the very complicated questions of power, equity, and justice. And the issue of personal data processing is at heart of those complicated questions, often in the tricky context of um, public-private partnerships. And um, indeed, uh, the deployment of surveillance technologies in public space, and including facial recognition, is often associated with defiance and lack of trust from population, mostly because of the lack of transparency in the deployment process and because of recurring examples of function creep. Uh, for example, those technologies deployed for crowd control purposes can also and were actually used to identify political opponents in some countries. Going back to the example of facial recognition deployed in the Sao Paulo um, subway, this is how cameras were actually removed within 48 hours following an action fight by the Brazilian Institute of um, Consumer Protection. So in practice, the use of facial recognition tools in public space really entails that data processing activities are conducted to um, a greater extent greater than, for instance, in the context of the use of targeted special investigation techniques in the course of criminal investigations. And as a result, if not properly managed, these tools can lead to a massive tracking of people's movements and activities. So checks and balances are therefore necessary to maintain the trust between police forces and the population. And 
effectively implementing the principle of specified and limited purpose for the use of facial recognition is also key to ensure um, a proportional use of the technology and also to avoid the function creep that I uh, mentioned just before. And um, this can only be achieved if effective safeguards for individuals are in place, while also taking into account, obviously, police legitimate operational needs. So key data protection principles to be considered from the outset are therefore, as mentioned, purpose limitation. The question could be for which, really for which specific and limited purpose is the facial recognition technology deployed? The principle of necessity is also important to consider. So another question would be in this regard, is a recourse to facial recognition necessary to achieve the purpose that has been defined? And is there any less invasive means to achieve this purpose, which is to maintain public security? Um, consider, consideration should also be given to uh, the principle of proportionality. Uh, for instance, are the modalities of deployment of facial recognition proportional to the purpose to be achieved? Uh, in practice, is the collection of data limited to a match against an authorized police database, or is it about um, other types of practice? Um, and finally, there is the principle of transparency, of course. Is the population informed of the deployment of facial recognition technology in public space? Um, is algorithmic uh, transparency in place as well, which is also an important question in the context of um, AI. In fact, just to be clear, facial recognition has a great potential to commit crime and to assist police forces in this task, but to ensure uh, not only a proportional but also a fit for purpose use of facial recognition is, is in place, it is really essential to also grasp the limits of this technology and to clearly guide its use in the field by uh, law enforcement agencies. So beside the quality of the facial technology tool, which can be used, and there are so many in the market uh, uh, today, these limits are in fact twofold and they concern first the data that is used to train the technology. So in consideration, for instance, of the quality of images that are used to train uh, the software and also the confidence threshold that is used to identify the results. So these elements have a tremendous impact on the reliability of the results and they can lead to false negative or false positive. A, a number of article, uh, articles have been uh, published in this regard. Um, so in this context, it should be considered this research, uh, 2018 research, uh, during which an MIT researcher showed actually how facial recognition systems register error rates of 34.7% for black women as compared to just 0.8 for white men. So in countries like Brazil, in which 64% of the prison population is black, there are real risks that facial recognition tools could go particularly wrong. So the quality of the data and the high level of confidence threshold are essential. Also in consideration of the fact that um, facial recognition can become um, a decision-making support tool for police action in public space, which may involve the use of force in some cases. Um, an important issue which is at stake, and as mentioned earlier, is um, that the tech response in the context of law enforcement raises the question of the collaboration between the private and the public sectors. Um, in particular, regarding the deployment of facial, facial recognition tools, as well as the processing of the personal data, which is collected uh, by those means. Obviously, public-private partnerships for law enforcement purposes must be clearly defined, and this is uh, in particular due to the um, different legal regimes uh, that apply, data protection legal regimes, actually, that apply to those stakeholders um, 
And if they are useful when well regulated, these public private partnerships can also become a real issue uh, for individuals, but also for the police. Um, in fact, the private sector is often in a privileged position regarding the use of tech because it has a know-how and also the financial and human resources to use and maintain uh, the technology. So in this context, this is how we have seen police forces sharing, for example, confidential pictures of wanted criminals with um, ICT companies for ident identification purposes through the use of facial recognition. And um, interestingly, a number of those private companies had not provided appropriate data protection safeguards uh, regarding the processing of this data. Um, conversely, we have seen police forces as well requesting bulk data from the private sector, especially telcos, uh, while overusing the purpose of public security or uh, national security. So this is therefore an important issue to take into, in, into consideration um, as well, this issue of um, public-private um, partnerships. Um, I would like now to turn to um, the second part of my presentation on the development of safeguards in the current context of uh, ethical artificial intelligence. Because in parallel of the security, uh, the tech security trend, 2020 has seen the emergence of ethical artificial intelligence that actually aims to provide actionable recommendations in order to ensure a more responsible use of the, uh, of the technologies. In the UK, for instance, earlier in August, the, the Court of Appeal found the use of facial recognition by South Wales police unlawful, and it actually called for a new legal framework. Um, the case followed a legal challenge that was brought by a civil rights group and, and the victim. The technology which was used by the police maps faces in a crowd by measuring the distance between features. It then compares the result with a watch list of images. And this watch list of images can include suspects, missing people, and persons of interest. Um, the victim's face was in fact scanned while he was Christmas shopping in 2017 and at a peaceful anti-arms protest in 20, 2018. Um, the victim had argued that it breached his human rights when his biometric data was analyzed without his consent or even knowledge. And in fact, the victim was neither a person of interest nor on a watch list. That was the interesting part also of the, uh, of the fact of the case. Um, so the court underlined the, the potential of the technology, clearly, and, and, and found the use that, uh, of facial recognition was proportionate, uh, proportionate interference with human rights as the benefits outweigh the impact on the victim. However, the court uh, said uh, also three other, um, basically mentioned three other important elements. First, that there was no clear guidance on where the technology could be used and who could be put on a watch list. Second, a data, a data protection impact assessment was clearly deficient. And the third point that was um, highlighted by the court was the fact that the police force did not take reasonable steps to find out if the software had racial or uh, gender bias. Um, the impact of this ruling will extend to other police forces. And it's interesting to see that it provides, according to the concerned law enforcement agency, clear guidance for the use of facial recognition in the field. And in fact, in recent developments, we have observed that there is a complementary role of the legislator, the judiciary and police forces to develop appropriate safeguards for individuals' rights, while again taking into consideration operational needs, technical capabilities, and also legal obligations, clearly. And um, this approach should be implemented in order to ensure an effective and responsible use of surveillance tools in public space, in particular uh, facial recognition, in the rapidly evolving tech environment. Um, 
Um, so these are really uh, the data protection safeguards that we could take into consideration and we have seen developing um, recently. As a conclusion, I would like to present possible avenues of research, maybe, and, and, and considerations uh, for the work of the Brazilian Commission of Jurists to draft the data protection law for the law enforcement sector, as this is uh, the, the current background also of the, the conference. Um, first of all, regarding the scope of the legislation, uh, as I mentioned again during my preliminary observations, I would like to strengthen, uh, again, the importance to develop two separate pieces of legislation. One governing the processing of personal data by police forces for crime investigation and prosecution purposes. And one governing the processing of personal data by intelligence services for national security and defense purposes. Obviously, Given the nature of some areas of action, for instance, the fight against terrorism, uh, we know that the frontiers uh, between the role of police forces and intelligence services can be blurred. Uh, this has been observed in the field. Uh, this is not new. So for this reason, it would be really important to regulate the transfer of personal data also between the police and intelligence services in order to avoid any legal no man's land, in fact. Um, another recommendation would be the regulation of the modalities of partnership between um, the private sector and police agencies regarding specifically the processing of personal data for law enforcement pur um, purposes. Um, we can also consider possible avenues of research concerning the, the content of the data protection legislation itself for, for police forces. and and. Those avenues of research could be, um, could be the following. Um, uh, a reference could be made to the limited purposes and modalities of the deployment and use of surveillance technologies. A and those could be further developed in technology-specific binding operating procedures that could be complementary. Um, reference could also be made to the conduct of data protection impact assessment by police forces. Um, the law could also include the principle of uh, transparency regarding surveillance modalities in public space. We've been discussing that uh, on several occasions to, during this uh, presentation. Um, it could also include the necessity of developing oversight mechanisms within police forces, which could be accountable to other public authorities. Those would be, in fact, mechanisms to, to really ensure the effective implementation of data protection safeguards, including when collecting data by means of surveillance technologies. And um, lastly, the law could include the creation of redress mechanisms as individuals must be able to initiate a grievance process regarding the processing of their personal data by, um, by law enforcement agencies. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. And I hope this was useful. Sophie, muito obrigada pela apresentação, por ter conseguido resumir em pouco tempo tantas questões importantes. A gente tem algumas questões chegando do público. É, e me parece interessante endereçar duas aqui de uma vez que tem relação com, com os últimos temas de que você estava falando. É, a gente tem é, tanto a Carolina Reis é, quanto um usuário anônimo perguntando é, sobre como pensar o uso das tecnologias para o law enforcement é, como discuti-las quando o problema de segurança pública é tão urgente em um país como o Brasil, se isso faz, se você vê alguma particularidade nisso, e ainda pensando nas particularidades do Brasil, se parece responsável começar a usar as tecnologias sem ainda termos um marco regulatório 
aprovado. Isso como questões mais gerais, eu trago as questões mais específicas em seguida. Thank you, thank you very much for, for those questions. Um, it's actually very tricky because the issue of urgency is always um, either a reason or an argument to justify, um, let's say, um, a very um, unthought uh, deployment of um, surveillance technologies in public space, including facial recognition uh, technologies. Um, but to try to avoid um, these situations, and because now we, we know that we are in the age of, um, of, of tech, uh, the security uh, tech um, uh, era, it's actually really important, first of all, to discuss a strategy uh, in, in the country uh, regarding the deployment of those, these type of surveillance. Um, we always talk, and it's about the legislation as well, but we always talk about technique uh, specific, uh, technology specific or technology neutral approach or legislation in this context it could be in really interesting to develop a really a technique specific approach to take into consideration the capabilities that certain surveillance technologies have in common to try to anticipate um, um, really safeguards and, and, and the role that each stakeholders involved could, uh, could play in order to really strengthen the safeguards for individuals. And, and actually also in view of providing proper guidance also to law enforcement agencies, because also sometimes it's interesting to observe that um, not only in the law enforcement sector, but in different sector, the, the use of tech is really seen, perceived as, um, the appropriate answer because this is a modern world, right? And if we want to be relevant, we need to be uh, to use the tech. But this, this also goes back to um, uh, the analysis of the needs in a specific country and the analysis of the needs and constraints of uh, the law enforcement agencies. Um, uh, so just in a nutshell, also to respond to the other question, I would say that maybe the best way to anticipate those issues uh, that, that appear in the context of uh, emergency situations, uh, the development of those strategies, national strategies could, um, and, and actually uh, regional strategies could also be um, further developed and to really put together uh, all uh, stakeholders, the relevant stakeholders that I mentioned earlier in the presentation, meaning uh, the judiciary, the legislature and police forces. I, I hope this uh, answers your question. Obrigada, Sophie. É, eu vou aproveitar também uma outra parte da sua apresentação em que você fala sobre, é, sobre efeitos das tecnologias de reconhecimento facial, é, sobre desigualdades, né? para pegar em duas perguntas que surgem aqui, é, uma pessoa também pergunta sobre vigilância em espaços públicos, se a gente não deveria considerar a própria distribuição das, câmara, das câmeras pela cidade como problemática, já que alguns grupos são mais vigiados do que outros, me parece que você tocou nisso é, brevemente, quando fala de possibilidade de discriminação, mas isso vem de uma outra perspectiva, né? da perspectiva mesmo de onde vigiar, me parece, se isso não deveria ser alvo de medidas de transparência, é, questionamento prévio. E ainda, quais são os impactos de discussões acerca do movimento Black Lives Matter, é, tão vivo né, nesse momento, com as pessoas indo às ruas para questionar o uso de tecnologias de vigilância por é, agentes policiais e também discutindo é, desinvestimento da polícia, né? como que isso toca no uso de tecnologias é, de vigilância e a proteção de dados pessoais, Sophie? Thank you again for the questions. Um, regarding the first question on um, the deployment of CCTV and 
this is actually pretty relevant because more and more uh, CCTV systems actually embed the facial uh, recognition technology, either facial recognition or, or behavioral um, recognition. So in this context, it's actually really important um, to say at least two things. First, the effectiveness of the CCTV system has has been actually showed in several contexts, but also the limits of those systems have been showed because those limits are linked to um, the necessity really, again, to uh, deploy those systems as an appropriate and proportional response to a specific situation in a country or in a city. For instance, if you want to deploy um, a CCTV systems embedding, for instance, facial recognition in, in, in specific areas in a country, for instance, in, uh, in, in Rio, um, you are supposed as uh, law enforcement agencies to recommend the, um, the deployment of those uh, technologies in areas where you have been conducted, uh, conducting a threat assessment. This is how we try to basically, the idea is to try to, um, to adopt really a neutral and objective approach in the deployment of the technology. And the basis of this deployment should be the threat, the threat assessment. But then if we talk about threat assessment, we, um, we also then address another problematic issue that is the operational criteria that are used to conduct this threat assessment. And the question is, are those criteria biased, gender or, or, um, or, or racially biased? That is a really important question. It's, 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 it's actually a question that often um, um, appears when we talk about uh, facial recognition, actually. Um, I didn't have time to, to mention it during the, the presentation, so I'm really happy that there is this question. Um, the issue of operational criteria developed by law enforcement agency to target uh, the surveillance and to properly deploy it is really important to avoid basically the situation that we have seen and, and, and basically led to the development of the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, matter movement. Um, so again, if at some point there is, um, uh, we put together the, uh, the stakeholders and they are also not only trained, not only oversight and audit mechanism, which are really important, but also training mechanisms to actually explain to law enforcement, this is how um, the, uh, the technology should be used and there should be no gender or um, racial bias. Otherwise, this is basically a backfire on the police, on the police work actually. And this is really also the best way to decredibilize not only the work of the police, but also the use of the tech. Um, um, and the text should not be the instrument to really um, uh, to, to pave the way to the situations that we have seen in the US and in many other countries in the world um, in the context of discrimination and, and let's say targeted and violent uh, arrests. Um, so in a nutshell, I would just kind of summarize this, this answer, really pointing out the necessity of threat assessment and the necessity to have a proper review of the um, uh, operational criteria that are used in the context of the threat assessment to also ensure that there's no um, uh, gender or racial bias um, when, when uh, implementing those uh, operational criteria. Obrigada, Sophie, por endereçar essas questões. A gente tem uma manifestação aqui também de uma participante, Ana Lígia, contando que ela é de Campina Grande, no, no estado da Paraíba, onde acontece um evento conhecido como a maior festa de São João do Mundo e para ter acesso ao evento as pessoas recentemente passavam por uma identificação facial. E foram feitas várias prisões de foragidos que tentavam ingressar no evento. É, eu vou endereçar agora algumas questões um pouco mais específicas que vieram. É, o Alexandre Teixeira pergunta sobre o caso Carpenter versus USA, 
de 2018, que foi um marco na questão de dados pessoais, privacidade e investigação criminal. E se você considera que a decisão da Suprema Corte dos Estados Unidos, quando anulou a condenação do réu, enfraquece a pretensão punitiva do Estado e o trabalho técnico da polícia. Se você sentir a vontade para comentar o caso, explicá-lo e, e passar pelas questões do Alexandre, seria excelente. Muito obrigada. Sorry, I'm not sure if there was um, a question um, uh, that was raised by the by the lady that is uh, living in no no okay. It was okay. Just... <laughs> um, so regarding the so then the first question, um, I would say that um, regarding the case that was mentioned, uh, basically the idea is is also to point out that. Um, there is a need for the balance, and we always go from one um, period of excess and uh, towards uh, um, or in favor of law enforcement agencies, and then that goes in the direction of um, sometimes overprotection, um, also of the population, uh, forgetting that originally the work of the police is actually to protect the population. So basically, the underlying uh, idea is to say this is what should be reminded to the population and actually to the police to say that the role of the police is to protect the population not to uh, not to carry carry surveillance um, operations and disproportional take disproportional measures uh, to combat crime in a let's say um, in a non-targeted way um, so I'm not sure if what I'm, I'm, I mean is, is, is clear, but uh, the, the idea is also try to, to try to reconcile um, uh, the, basically the very reason of uh, existence of those police forces and what the population should expect. That is protection from the police. So this means that the police should have the means to work but the police should be also prevented and therefore uh, there should be oversight to make sure that there is no misuse and there is no arbitrary use of their, not only their powers, but the means that they, are, uh, they have actually um, available, including technology. And this actually goes back and maybe that's something that, I don't know if it's something that we could say that is missing in the case is this issue of the trust because beyond the legal, uh, the legal issues and um, um, the civil rights issues that we've been discussing already, I would say that, that the, really at the heart of this issue is the issue of trust. So then the question is what could we do to really um, make sure that this issue of trust does not appear anymore? So what can be done? And mention, for instance, clear guidance provided to police forces I mentioned more transparency, that's something that could be done on the part of not only police forces, but also uh, with the support of the legislator, for instance, because at some point also uh, law enforcement agencies are supposed to implement uh, legislation. So that's why I was trying also uh, to try to, to, to transform the issues that we've been uh, discussing during the presentation into possible avenues of recommendation for uh, the drafting of the legislation. Um, so that's my answer and I hope that was clear enough. Obrigada, Sophie. Eu gostaria de me voltar agora para uma parte um pouco mais propositiva. É, opa, eu acho que eu não liguei o português aqui. Voltando para o canal em português. É, obrigada, eu queria voltar para uma parte mais propositiva que você endereçou no final da sua fala, é, mas vem algumas perguntas um pouco mais específicas sobre isso também. É, primeiro, é, se tem alguma legislação sobre esses pontos que você indicou que você considere satisfatória ou digna de nota. É, essa é uma pergunta da Heloísa Estelita, 
aqui no, no chat. É, além disso, vou aproveitar para colocar uma outra questão. É, eu sei que você tem experiência em organizações internacionais como a Interpol, onde você participou de é, projetos de elaboração de lei sobre smart surveillance, e você também tocou nisso, mas mais especificamente sobre smart surveillance technologies, quais são os pontos que você considera relevantes é, a respeito dessas tecnologias, se você pudesse é, se aprofundar um pouco mais nisso. Obrigada. Thank you. Um, so maybe I will start by answering the second question. So I guess this is from a practical point of view, why the use of smart surveillance technologies could be useful in the context of law enforcement, if, if I understood, um, if I understood well. Um, So one of the arguments um, that, that is presented by law enforcement agencies is, um, is really the operational needs linked to the lack of resources uh, in a context uh, that really is about the use of tech, but not by the uh, law enforcement agency, but by all the people, including criminals, uh, to carry out their illegal activities. So then the question is, how can the police uh, face and combat this, um, um, this phenomenon with no appropriate means and maybe also with no, uh, uh, not enough human resources, because that's also a big issue. We always talk about uh, cutting budgets and that reminds me that Uh, that's uh, also an issue that was raised in the context of a Black uh, Lives Matter. Um, should we cut also uh, the budget of police, uh, police forces? Uh, the budget in some cases is already very limited, uh, which is also an issue to be, to be considered. So, uh, some law enforcement agencies have um, thought about these issues And as some in a, at management level have identified smart surveillance technologies as a, a cost effective way um, to address some criminal phenomenon. Um, those technologies in some contexts have been uh, proven useful. Uh, for instance, in the context of major events, we're talking about uh, um, uh, sport event, uh, more political economic event uh, with an international dimension. Those major events were also really um, um, situations during which those uh, surveillance, smart surveillance technologies were deployed uh, and thanks to which criminals have been identified. Um, so they have been seen, those technologies, effective from an operational point of view and also cost effective. That's also an element has, that has been um, uh, pointed out by police, uh, police agencies. Um, but again, what I've heard also from police officers is also the, really the necessity to work on those operational criteria, because the idea is also to target the surveillance, right? To use operational target um, criteria in the context. If I talk again about a, a, a crowd uh, control context and I talk about a major event, if I am a police officer, I would like to have proper operational criteria to have a targeted surveillance operation, so not to have everyone on my radar. So that's the idea. And coming from some police officers, uh, it was also clearly said that in the context of, of, of um, um, recent and developing uh, criminal um, phenomena, sometimes it was difficult for law enforcement agencies to really um, develop those operational criteria. And, and, and that was actually uh, really presented as an operational issue for them as well. Uh, because coming from some of these agencies, the idea is to, is to say we don't need uh, 
all this information. It's actually a problem if we get too much information, we need to have a collected approach, uh, a targeted approach on the collection of data, because then it's too much to analyze. And not all the agencies, if I talked about the cost and the budget, not all agencies have um, actually the financial resources to actually exploit and analyze the data that has been collected. Uh, so then it's, it's really, uh, not only a problem for the police, but beyond the problem for the individuals that should not be subject to massive surveillance. But then for some police officers, the idea is to say, is it surveillance? Because some data is collected, but it's never used. The answer from a data protection point of view would be to say, well, it's actually data collected and it's actually um, stored in a database. So maybe it's not used today, but it can be used tomorrow. But that shows actually the, 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 the fact that there are some gray areas um, uh, in the context of uh, law enforcement and data protection. Um, so yes, that was, uh, I would say, the answer to, to the second question. Um, the, the first question was about, um, I'm sorry, but Mariana. It was, it was about if there are any, desculpa, português. É, <risos> essa mudança de línguas bagunça. É, é uma, era sobre se há alguma lei que pode ser considerada modelo. É, se há boas leis para indicar, exemplos a seguir, é, mesmo que sejam questões diferentes de leis diferentes, né? Pensando aí da perspectiva mais propositiva e de onde se inspirar. Ok. Um, thank you. Um, so, we, uh, it's, it's actually difficult because it's, we don't have enough distance to say like which countries has the best practice in terms of data protection, but what we can actually say that um, in terms of evidence, what are really the legislation that include um, uh, really key data protection principles in law enforcement? The effective implementation is something that we need to wait for uh, to, to, to assess. But really regarding the content of the legislation, um, I don't want to be seen as always using uh, European, <laughs> European examples because it's not that this isn't a panacea, but it's true that because of the GDPR, for instance, uh, and because of the directive uh, on law enforcement, um, um, stringent legislations have been developed uh, in the EU on the basis of, uh, of these, um, I would say, high level standards, including in the context of, um, uh, of law enforcement. Uh, so the those have been replicated in different countries uh, in the EU, uh, with some actually, um, I would say, uh, differences, because especially in the context of, um, in reference to national security, um, because these according to, um, uh, uh, to the EU legislation is basically the, of the competence of, uh, of uh, national countries, right? Uh, so in some countries, uh, regarding national securities, different perspectives have been uh, adopted. But the common uh, denominator is the fact that the role of the police, again, and the role of uh, intelligence services are distinct, and including in the specifically in the context of data processing operations. Um, so to be a bit more uh, a bit more specific, we have seen uh, interesting legislation developed uh, in um, in Germany. We have seen also in France, um, and beyond the European Union, we have seen also um, in um, in countries, including in Africa, like Senegal. Uh, countries actually using and reflecting the standards that are um, uh, actually uh, provided for in the, uh, the EU tools, whether uh, it is about the regulation or uh, the, uh, the directive. Uh, so that's also is an interesting development. Um, 
we have in terms of um, law enforcement really activities if this is also the question uh, I would again go back to um, to the example of Germany and uh, beyond the EU I would also use the example maybe of um, Um, of Switzerland, actually. It's still Europe, I have to say, um, but we are beyond the, beyond the EU. Uh, so these are spontaneously the type of examples I could, um, uh, I could mention, but we have also interesting countries that access to the uh, uh, European Convention. Uh, actually, uh, some, some countries like Uruguay um, need to be uh, carefully followed up in this in this regard, and could be of uh, of interest. Thank you. Obrigada. É, muito obrigada, Sophie. Obrigada por essa hora toda conversando é, com a gente. É, Somos realmente muito agradecidos pela sua participação. Queria agradecer também a participação do público. É, sinto muito, algumas perguntas ficam não respondidas por causa do limite de tempo, mas a gente ainda tem muitas atividades ao longo do Congresso. Queria convidá-los e convidá-las é, hoje para o próximo painel, que vai ser às 19 horas, é um painel chamado Do Domicílio aos Dados, o debate constitucional sobre privacidade, intimidade e proteção de dados no Brasil, com a participação da professora da FGV, Heloísa Machado, e o professor da USP, Gustavo Badaró. Então, espero encontrar vocês hoje à noite. Sophie, você gostaria de fazer alguma intervenção final, se despedir de alguma forma. I would like to say goodbye and thank you again uh, for having me and thank you for the audience for the very uh, interesting questions. Thank you again. And wishing you all the best for uh, the rest of the conference. Nós que agradecemos aqui em nome do Internet Lab. É, muito obrigada, até as próximas mesas, pessoal. <música>